We are looking at our third week of this Christmas series, and we're calling the Christmas series Investigating Jesus because, um, as with all things, if we are investigating the claims of who Jesus is and who Jesus was in terms of what the Bible says, um, we think it's important. You can do that about all sorts of his life and his birth and his death and his resurrection. Uh, we're doing it specifically about Christmas, about the birth uh, of Jesus. But now, investigating Christmas, you know, you can learn all sorts of interesting things, especially when it comes to the traditions uh, of Christmas. And, you know, this week we're talking about joy. That's the week we're talking about in the Advent. And so, you know, joy is oftentimes talked about at Christmas time. It's like the spirit of Christmas. You know, everybody's a little nicer. Everybody's a little bit more merry. Everybody's a little bit more joyful. Everyone's excited. I don't know why. Maybe they're getting a Christmas bonus. Maybe they're just happy to have a few days off. Maybe they're going to see family and that does make them happy, you know, kind of thing. Like, we don't know, but a lot of people just tend to have that. And it's funny when you look back again at the history of, of, of kind of these things. Uh, one of the things that always made me laugh is that when people say the spirit of Christmas, if you just Google that and look this up, okay, this is the fun part. If you just look up what the spirit of Christmas is and where it comes from, it's not at all what we say and think it means, okay? The spirit or the spirits of Christmas was something people feared you know, based on rumors and folklore and so forth and so on from the Middle Ages, they not only, you know, during the winter solstice, not to, they, they gathered together, not just for survival, but during the winter solstice, they felt that they were the most vulnerable to spiritual attack. And so they thought the more people that gathered together in homes and the more people that kind of hung their, their holly and hung their evergreens and all that kind of thing, they would basically ward off evil spirits like there's more of us here than you, so, you know, back off. So if you look that up, you're just like, that's so not what we mean when we say the spirit of Christmas, right? We're talking about good things and joyful things. And, and again, that's part of the reason why, you know, you can have your traditions. We hope you enjoy them. Uh, it's good to know where those traditions come from. But we wanted to look at this kind of, you know, 1,600-year-old kind of the heritage of the church practicing what we call the Advent not just in terms of an Advent calendar that counts the last 25 days of Christmas or whatever you know, you've know you seen before, but the actual four weeks of Advent that's actually a, a beautiful tradition uh, that the church has held for many, many years. And that, this is interesting. The third week is uh, different and unique, and, and, and I don't know this is not going to be surprising to you, but it was to me, when I was researching this, um, you know, there's lots of different ways people do their advent wreath or calendar, and there was one time a, a wagon wheel that had all little candles, like, you know, 28 candles on it and things like that. But here's what's really cool. The third week, they call it Gaudete, Gaudete Sunday, which is from the Latin rejoice, okay, in, in between Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, even Baptists, like all of them, right, look at this third week and say, okay, it's special, it's unique, and it all comes down to this Gatete, Rejoice Sunday from the Latin, which is about joy, and they all agree it should be this pink candle, right? This pink candle all represents this joy, and, and, and I had somebody ask me last week, because I, I can't know for sure if you were raised knowing this, they've never seen an Advent candle in church before, and so they were like, did you run out of candles? Did you know? Did you you know? You know that kind of thing, which sounds like a very journey thing to do, by the way. Like <laughs> somebody go grab a pink candle and let's get this thing growing. But I said no. It's actually it's amazing. It's got all this history and heritage. And listen, just as a guy, I, I know that this may not be impressive to you, but if you can get Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists degree on anything, that's amazing. All right. So from a heritage standpoint, that's really cool that this third Sunday kind of stands out. Right? We, we talked about hope and, and peace, and we'll talk about love next week, and these are the four uh, primary themes. But joy, like I said, across the board, everybody seems to agree that joy is the third week because it's really all about the angel's proclamation of joy to the shepherds when actually Jesus is, is born. So it's this joy, this anticipation part of Advent of the birth of of Jesus. So that's where we're going to start reading today. This is in Luke 2. If you'll pull out your, uh, your Bibles or your apps, um, Luke 2, uh, we're going to start in verse 8, kind of picking up where we were, were last week, but we're going to talk specifically about um, what the angel's proclamation was uh, to the shepherds. And so yesterday, if you weren't here, uh, we had this really awesome celebration with all the families at Journey with our, our elementary school and, and high school or uh, middle school families. And we built these little uh, 
gingerbread nativities called Gingerbread Bash and had a lot of fun worshiping and just kind of hanging out with our families yesterday and uh, it was a lot of fun. And one of the questions that they asked uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the program was, hey, if you could put yourself into any point of the nativity story, where would you be? Like what part of the story would you like to have seen or been, been a part of? And I'll be honest, for me, it's right here. Like, it's, it's this section we're getting ready to read. Like, it's this moment. I mean, you know, I'd love to be there at the birth of Jesus too, but this moment to me is just phenomenal. Um, and so we're going to pick up to verse 8 to share what this moment was. Um, this is after the baby has been born. Uh, Mary and Joseph made it into to Bethlehem. They've had their baby, and then this is what happens. Verse 8. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. I love that, again, that picture. And you guys have heard me say this before. I love the movies at Christmas time. Like, I love stories about the nativity. Um, and we've been watching the newest one around our house. And I, I, I just love all of them. I, I used to love plays when I was a kid when they would do, like, nativity plays and things like that. Like, I just love people telling the story of the birth of Jesus. And, again, this is always in an effort to kind of take it past the fairy tale, you know, take it past the, the fictional idea of this really great, quote-unquote, story, but to understand what really happened. And again, for me, I mean, you know, we've gone, we've gone pretty crazy with the CGI and the effects and what we can do in movies, but I'll be honest, I haven't seen a movie yet, okay? I haven't seen a production yet that can get this moment like the way it's actually probably happened. I don't, I don't know, listen, I don't know what it looks like for the sky to split open and for the glory of God to surround you. But I bet you, I mean, again, I haven't experienced anything like that on a flat screen TV, right? For, I don't care if it's 4D, 3D, 7D, I don't care. Like, it's, it's, it hasn't happened for me, and I don't think it will happen. Now, hopefully, maybe in our lifetimes, we'll see it again, because we're waiting on another advent, right? But I'm telling you, in this moment, the sky splits open, and there's an angel, and then there's the army of heaven joining together, all declaring what the angel had just said. And I love this little precursor of what the angel said when he said, don't be afraid. He says, I bring you good news that brings great joy to all people. Those three phrases to me encapsulate this beautiful moment that we celebrate today in terms of joy. Go ahead and go back to those three. Let's read them out loud so we can say them together. Let's read these three phrases. Ready? Good news, great joy for all people. Good job. Let's do it again. You guys ready? Let's do it again. Good news, Great joy for all people. Yeah, it's the good news of great joy for all people. And as I really begin to think about joy, I mean, just think about joy. We know, and you guys are all intelligent people, you know joy is not the same thing as happiness, right? Happiness is an emotion. Happiness is momentary. It's something circumstantial, you know, that makes you happy, but it doesn't last. It's not the same thing as joy. Joy is deeper. Joy is more. Joy is a state of mind. Joy is something that, that really digs in. And when I start looking at this and I go, wow, there's, there's the angel saying, we've got this good news of great joy. This is the kind of joy he's talking about. And it's for everyone, right? I know people love the old King James or, the, you know, when, when uh, or you didn't know King James. Uh, it's when Linus tells the story, you know, in, in the Peanuts uh, thing. Yeah, Linus, by the way, tells the King James version. So anyway, Linus says, um, you know, uh, uh, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill to mankind, right? To goodwill to all men, which all men love because it gets us in there in the story. We're like, yep, goodwill to us. He was happy for everybody. And this kind of takes me to my first thing because when I started thinking about the joy that we celebrate this week, I always think about a few things pretty, pretty commonly. I think about a few things about what this joy really means. And here's why I say it. I think people 
experience joy to the degree that they actually understand what that joy actually is. They experience the fullness of joy or the lasting joy or the satisfying joy or the overflowing joy really to the degree that they understand what kind of joy we're talking about. So I want to walk you through what this joy looks like, especially what the angel was declaring. First things first, joy brings salvation to everyone, right? Now, what's this right here? Everybody say it out loud. What is that? Yeah. I hate these things, right? You know what that means? It means there's fine print somewhere, right? It means something. I was trying to get Tracy a new phone or just upgrade her for this thing, and I was going through all the the things with Verizon, you know, get a free this and upgrade to this, and we just give you seven phones for free and blah, 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 blah. And I went through it, and she was eligible as far as I could tell. And you get through the whole process, and then it gets to the end, they're like, oh, yeah, you don't qualify. You know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're not, that's not for you. I hate, I hate those exceptions, right? Like, like those, those fine print moments. But here's the reality, okay? And, and, I, and, I get, and I say this, not being able to go deep into the theological side of this, but this good news of great joy for everyone meant a whole lot, even to the Jewish people, even to Paul and the New Testament writers, because this joy was coming not just to help and save the Jews, but for everyone who would receive him. But that's what that asterisk actually means. It means that a gift that's given must be received. In order for it to have any benefit, in order for it to actually do anything, a gift that's given has to be received. I could give you a, a, you know, a, a briefcase of a million dollars, right? And you could carry it around, throw it in your trunk, drive around, and has it changed your life at all? No, because you didn't really receive it. You you didn't really take hold of it. You really didn't take possession of it. So the reality is, is that, yes, this kind of joy that was coming was going to bring salvation to everyone. That's this joy that we, the good news that we have, but the reality is, is not everyone was going to receive it. And here's a great example in the life of Jesus when uh, Matthew, you know, when he was he was asking and getting his disciples. Uh, Matthew, uh, Jesus calls out Matthew and says, let's have dinner at your house. And I want you to invite your friends over. So this is going to be in Matthew 10, or sorry, 9, verse 10. It says, Matt, later on, Matthew invited Jesus and the disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable Sinners. Now pause there for a minute, Tony, because this is important to me, and I, I say this every time we, we get to scriptures like this. You got to be a special kind of sinner to get your own category of sin. Okay? And that is one of the reasons that these are always said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when he talks specifically about the people. They said, look, here's these disreputable, you know, deplorable people, sinners, and tax collectors. Everybody with me? Like you couldn't just leave it at that. Tax collectors were not just sinners. They were, they were people who had betrayed their Jewish brethren, like betrayed them at, the, at, at a deep level. So they had a special place. I hate to say it this way, but they kind of viewed it like, well, you had a special place in hell because there's, I mean, you are the worst of the worst of the worst. And so here's Matthew inviting all his tax collector friends and, and this, these disreputable sinners and then the Pharisees see it. Well, they go to the disciples and they say, why? Why does your teacher, your rabbi, why does he eat with such scum? I mean, they, don't even, they weren't even hiding it. Like these, these guys are the worst. Why would he do that? Why would he engage them? Why would he talk to them? Why would he go to dinner with them? Why would he have them in a home and rubbing shoulders with them? Like this was against everything they had in their Jewish uh, understanding. And then it said, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, he responded and said, look, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I know that sounds really logical and simple, right? Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. But he explains it by saying this a little bit further in verse 13. He says, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but to those who know that they're sinners. I've come. Salvation is for everyone who's going to receive it. But the reality is, is even this moment, Jesus knows, look, there's plenty of people who think they're fine. There's plenty of people who think they're righteous. They think they're healthy. They think they got it figured out. They think they got this thing covered. They're going to they're gonna approach God and eternity on their own terms. 
And he says, look, I, I've come. I'm giving salvation to everyone who will receive it. But I, I'm calling those, not those who think everything's fine, I'm calling those who know they need a Savior. Isn't that funny? Because he says, the angel says, good news of great joy to all people. And then he says the same words, a Savior is born. Well, you don't, there's good news about having a Savior is not good news unless you need saving from something. A Savior is only good news if you understand that you need saving, that you need a Savior. And again, this is not the kind of good news we like, you know, the Hallmark cards and the Christmas good news. That's not the kind of good news we like. We, it's because we have this weird, faulty measurement of, of good and bad, right? So here's, here's, uh, here's the good and bad we use. Uh, now, none of us in the room here would, would say that we're bad, all right? But we would all acknowledge that there's bad people in this world, right? Nod your head if you agree, right? There's, there's bad people. Well, none of us are them, but we, there are bad people. We live in this world of, well, we're not that bad, right? Or we're kind of average good, if not good. We're fine. We're good, right? Now, I want you to understand, none of this exists in Scripture, right? None of that is biblical at all, right? This is just what mankind has come up with to make ourselves feel better about how we measure our goodness or our not that badness, right? And, and we're always trying to crawl from one thing to another. Even Christmas time, right? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, right? Uh-huh, you better be good. So this is, this is where we kind of immediately, people just discount experiencing the joy they should be experiencing because they really don't think they're that bad. Or they're average, average good possibly even good. And they're going to spend their whole life trying to tweak and crawl and climb from not that bad to average to good. And they're going to miss out on the joy, the good news that brings great joy to us because we all need a Savior. Paul said, we all fall short. We all, like no one, no one gets to, to declare this about themselves. No one. We all fall short of God's standard. We all need a Savior. And here's how Jesus says what happens. What happens when you, when you, Jesus is describing the relationship we get to have with God because of the relationship that he had with God. This is in the same chapter where you've maybe read, abide with me and I with you. And this is in John 15. And here's what he says. He says, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as when I obey my Father's command, I remain in his love, meaning that we're abiding together in this relationship. When you live the way I've called you to live, the same way that I am living the way my Father has called me to live. And he says, and I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will, what's the word? Say it out loud. Overflow. This joy is going to overflow. Now, most of us see overflow, and when we think of overflow, it's always bad right? The toilet's overflowing, the bath is overflowing, the dishwasher's overflowing, the sink is over. Like we think overflowing and it's a problem, right? Everybody with me? But man, you're going to find so many times in scripture that not only does God talk about the fullness that we get to receive because of him, the fullness, right? Like we're going to be filled with, satisfied with, completely satisfied with him, but then we get to have this like spillover, this overflow. And he says, that's what this joy is. The joy in this relationship you get to have with God because the good news of Jesus came to save us is not just going to fill you, but it's going to spill over on everybody around you. That's incredible. Here's the second thing I, I want to talk about this joy just because of not just our culture, but we're going to look at something even a hundred years ago that was written. Um, joy Again, because it's different than happiness, joy itself is actually produced by faith. Joy is actually produced by our trusting in God, putting sort of all of our weight and, and hope and trust into God. That's where joy actually comes from. That's where it's actually a part of. This is a quote from Henri Newman. This is a, a Dutch professor and, and um, priest. He actually says this. He says, joy does not simply happen to us, 
right? We have a choice. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. His, his argument was that, you know, joy is not something that's a natural thing, but, but it's something you have to choose. It's something you have to kind of like be intentional about. And again, I think we all experience joy to the degree that we actually understand it because joy is not really an emotion, although joy can come with and, and, and can walk beside of our emotions. Here's how it's described. Paul describes it this way to the church in Galatia. He says, the Holy Spirit produces, meaning that it comes from him. The Holy Spirit in us, working in us when we're walking in step with him, when we're living out the ways he's called us to live, as Jesus said, you know, obey my commandments and abide with me, it produces this fruit. That's how he describes it, this fruit in our lives. Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We've told you that before. This is not a checklist for you in the morning, right? This is something that, that you're not supposed to try to figure out how to get these things. It's just by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life that you should be experiencing these things, joy being one of them because of the work that the Holy Spirit's doing in you because of your relationship with God, right? It's produced by faith. Now, let me, let me just kind of share with you, this is some, some research that uh, Whitney he did for me this week, and we were, we were running across this guy named F.B. Meyer, and he's an old English pastor, professor, theologian, and he had some interesting takes on joy, okay? If you read some of his papers or a couple of his books, he, he passed away again like 100 years ago. This is a 19th century guy, um, but he was basically back then even telling us like, Walking us through this, this thing, he was before a bunch of psychologists, Christian psychologists, he was a pastor, and they actually called him a doctor of the soul, right? Because he wanted to help people understand heart meaning behind things. Not just cold, hard scripture, but like the heart, and what does it mean to you and to your soul care, right? Was, I mean, that was, that was not that popular back then. So here's some of the things I just love that he wrote. Because he's talking a lot about where we find joy and how it happens. He says, we have no direct control over our feelings. The argument he makes is that feelings come. Uh, somebody jumps out from behind the corner and you go, ah! you know, that's a feeling that comes on you, that's scared or whatever. Like feelings can kind of just happen because feelings are natural. And he says, you don't have any direct control over them not happening. He says, but our wills, our choices are ours and to make them gods. He's basically like, our will, is, our choices are ours and we can make them gods. God does not hold us responsible for what we feel, but for what we will. So he doesn't hold you responsible for the fact that you got scared. He doesn't look at the shepherds and be like, why are you scared? <laughs> you know, he goes, you know, don't stay scared. Like, don't choose not to be. Why? Because I've come to bring you great, no great no good news of great joy. Like, the idea is, what will we do with our will? Therefore, let us, therefore, not live in the summer house of emotion, but in the central citadel of will, wholly yielding and devoted to the will of God, to make our will wholly yielded and devoted to the will of God. So here's the example he gave, and you're going to find this really amazing, because this is, again, over 100 years ago that he wrote this down. But he basically was giving the countercultural contrast of joy, and where does joy and emotion kind of kind of kind of come along and happiness come, come along with how we approach things in life. And so here's what he said. He said the world is going to approach it this way. They're going to start with whether or not they feel joy, which for most people, feeling joy is just feeling happy, right? It's, it's happiness. They're searching for happiness. And they're going to let their feelings dictate their truth. Does that sound familiar to anybody at all? right? They're going to let their feelings dictate what is true, what is factual, what is real. And then they're going to go to their faith, and they're going to want their faith to help make sense of what their feelings have said is true. And what happens here is that, again, people will, when they have feelings and feelings dictate truth, then they have to somehow kind of change what the Bible says, they have to adopt or uh, kind of find a false narrative or a false gospel to fit their feelings so that it can be true, so that their faith will align. Everybody with me? 
And that, yet that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not what God has declared. He's like, no, I have, there's an absolute truth and a reality to our lives that is true because of who God is. Our faith then informs our feelings, right? The truth of the matter runs through the fact that we trust the truth with God. And because of that, we get to experience all the feelings. Emotions aren't bad, but we get to experience them in light of what is true, in light of our trust with God. Here's, here's another quote uh, from F.B. Meyer in one of his papers. We cannot produce our own joy, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit that grows naturally on a healthy tree. Faith bears fruit in feeling, right? Happy and blessed feelings are the effect of the Spirit's working in the soul. It, it's basically him saying, like, look, you want to be happy, that's great, like you need to know what's true you need to see that in light of how you trust God because our faith produces right our faith produces our joy and we'll get to experience the feelings at a lasting deep satisfaction level because it's coming from him because it's being sort of it's the working of the Holy Spirit in our souls Here's how Peter said it to the church. This is Peter. Peter was basically telling the church, look, you didn't get to walk with Jesus the way I got to walk with Jesus, and yet you're still trusting him. And here's what he said. He said, you love him even though you've never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him. You put your faith in him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Like this joy is yours because you trust him, because of your faith. He says, your reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. That's the reward for trusting him. So this joy we're talking about, again, it's, it's salvation for us, yes, and it is produced by our faith, meaning that our faith kind of should be, it can't be an afterthought of what we're feeling, whether we're feeling happy or not, and whether we think it's true or not, we have to believe in absolute truth viewed through the lens of trusting God in order to experience that lasting joy. But here's the third one really quickly. And many of you guys know this just because of personal experience. Joy helps us endure suffering. Help, joy helps us walk through trials to the other side in a way that nothing else can. That's what this joy does. James, the brother of Jesus, says it this way. Again, James says this to the early church. All right, and I want you to see this because, you know, I want you to hear me clearly. Suffering, no suffering, produces happiness or joy. All right, again, just, just let's walk through this very quickly. We're suffering, we're struggling, we're going through hardship, we're going through trauma. That doesn't produce any good feelings. And if we're going by the world's math, and it's like, well, my feelings are going to dictate what's true about that situation, and then I have to figure out how my faith is going to respond. Versus what's the reality is that this is what James says to the church. He says, brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Notice that even James says, look, there's nothing about the suffering that's joyful, okay? We're not, we're not, we're not passing some sort of weird religious cultish Christianity where you're going to go through a horrible thing and you're going to paint a smile on your face and you're going to be like, <laughs> I'm so blessed. No, suffering stinks, right? Like, like struggles are hard, like the, the, the struggle's real, that's okay. There's nothing about the struggling or the suffering itself that's supposed to produce joy. He's saying, but you can view it as an opportunity for great joy. Why? He says this, you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Let it grow because when it's fully developed, when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, and needing nothing. Don't see that complete and perfect as better than anybody else. Just see it as you'll be complete in Christ. You'll be complete in your fullness of understanding this joy. There's nothing, again, in our suffering. We don't have joy in the the suffering, but opportunity for great joy helps us walk through our suffering. 
And when we sing a song here called The Potter and the Clay, and I love that, the verses because it just says, look, no, no failure, no mistake, no struggle, no hardship, no, no tension, no anxiety. Like nothing is going to be wasted when you give it to God. Nothing is wasted when you give it to him. Because if you consider this, you have your eye on the big picture and the perspective is, I mean, that requires perspective that only God can give you. You can walk through that suffering. You can walk through that trial and that hardship. And again, nothing would be wasted because it's all going to, it's all going to point to the glory of God at some point. It's hard for our minds to see it, but he sees it. And we got to trust him with it. So I want to do something really quickly as we close out. Uh, this is a question. It's a great question to ask every once in a while. And it's a question that I, as I ask it here in church, I do not want you to rush to the immediate Christian right answer, okay, uh, because you're here. I want you to, I think it's okay to say, to just sit with it for a minute. Okay, here's the question. What brings you joy? What brings you joy? And, and I want you to know it's okay if you don't have a quick answer to this question, right? It's okay to not have a quick response to this. I mean, every once in a while, I'll, I get asked this question or I'll think about it and it's like, oh, I mean, I know the right answer because I'm a pastor, you know. I know what to say. But it may not be what I'm actually, this may not be true. It may not be what I'm feeling. Why? Because sometimes a lack of joy is a lack of my faith. It's an absence of faith. I've been trusting in the wrong things, which is why I'm not experiencing the joy I should be experiencing. But, but when you wrestle with this question, like, what does bring you joy? Because I want you to understand that our joy is what's on display for the rest of the world. Our joy. Our joy is what's truly on display for the rest of the world. And the world is desperate, desperate for a lasting joy. Desperate. Now, does the world know how to get it? No. They're going to continue to let their feelings dictate what is true and, and, and then bring faith along and kind of make it whatever they need it to be. I mean, that, that's, they'll sell you and whatever, anything right now in the moment to get those happy endorphins rolling. They'll, that's, that's the world's approach to this, but they're still desperate for it. People are, even the healthy, even the ones that Jesus said are, that don't know they need anything, they're still looking for the answer. They just don't know that it's Jesus. And for you and for me, we've been given the great news, the good news of great joy for those people, for everyone. We are the ones who should be experiencing it at a much deeper level because we should be the ones who understand it best. We should be the ones who understand it the best. And that's what's on display. Right? Here's how Paul says it to the church in Rome. And I love this. This is actually a really cool recap for these past few weeks. Uh, this, this set of verses, which is why I was kind of waiting this week to share it. But again, it's some of the same words we've read before. I pray that God, through the, he's the source of hope. He will fill you completely with joy, right? Again, that, those, lang, those words, the filling, the satisfaction of this lasting joy and peace because you, what? Trust in him. That's your faith. Then you will overflow. There's that word again. You will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll have no choice for, for it to spill over. So what's spilling over in your life right now? Is it stress? Is it anxiety? Is it contention? Is it frustration? What's spilling over to the people in your life? What's spilling over to your kids? What's spilling over to your spouse? What's spilling over to the people you work with? I is it joy? 
Not the Christmas spirit kind of joy, right? Is it this lasting, satisfying, great joy that the angel spoke about? I want to take a minute as we pray and close out just, just to let us sit with the question. You know? If that's not what's spilling over, then I want you to consider what, what is bringing you joy. And don't, don't take any of the answers that come to your mind as immediately wrong, right? Because, I mean, there's a lot of things that bring me joy. My family brings me joy. When we have time, you know, our kids are getting older. And, you know, my wife and I were talking about this the other night because she was asleep already in the chair. And then her older kids came home and she was, like, awake. And, you know, and you know how it is when you fall asleep and you wake back up, you're kind of a little miserable. You know what I'm saying? But she was trying to, like, fight that misery because, you know, we, we, don't, get, we don't get tons of time with all of our family together as much as we used to when they were all young and we controlled all the schedules. All the parents in here know what I'm talking about, right? Like, you don't get to control their schedules their whole life. So we just, there's times where we just soak up the joy of being a family. So I'm waiting to hear. Those are okay. Like, hearing those things is fine. But when you go level down after level after level, I want you to get past the experiences and I want you to get past the circumstances and I want you to just be honest. Are, are you just chasing some emotions? Are you chasing happiness? Are you chasing satisfaction? Are you chasing you know, success? Are you chasing contentment? Are you chasing you know, just these emotions that you want to have? Or are you just running from emotions that you don't want to have? You're running from depression. You're running from anxiety. You're running from worry. You're running from the stress. Like, like you're doing everything you can to distract yourself from it. Because that's usually the cycle that people are on. They're running towards an emotion or they're running away from an emotion. And you'll never get past the surface to any type of lasting joy. And I want us to remember today that we, we've been given the gift of good news. That's great joy, lasting joy for everyone. But we've been given, we've, we've received it. Those in the room here, we've received it. And if you haven't received it, I'll invite you to do that again today as well. But I want to just take a minute, just a minute, in prayer. I know this isn't something we do often, but reflect, pray, and wrestle with the question, what brings me joy? Confess to God what you need to, repent to God what you need to, pray to God what you need to, and then I'll wrap us up in prayer together, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much that you are the author of joy, that, that we were given this proclamation 2,000 plus years ago, and because of that, um, God, because of this gift that you gave us, the Savior, we, we get to experience this great and good news of great and lasting joy. And we know that we get to share it with everyone. And yet, God, I, I firmly believe we experience joy to the level we truly understand how it comes from you and by your Holy Spirit. And so, God, right now, as we just take a few minutes, by your Holy Spirit, just do a work in our hearts as we wrestle with this question. What is bringing us joy right now?
Father God, we confess right now the emotions that we're chasing to try to bring us joy. We repent and confess maybe of the, of the things we're running from, the emotions that we're running from in order to, again, try to just give us moments of peace and joy. And yet, God, we are not experiencing the fullness of what you have promised us. So, Father God, I just declare this morning by the working of your Holy Spirit that we would walk from here and begin to have a taste and experience of absolute, true, great, and lasting joy. That what you said, Jesus, when you said that, uh, you know, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you came to give us life, and you came to give us life in the full and life abundant. And that, God, we really can not just be filled with this joy, but we can overflow. And what people will recognize in our lives is not the stress or the worry or the concern or the, or the judgment or the, or the negativity or the things that have been overflowing out of us for far too long, but they will start to recognize the difference when joy begins to spill over. When real, true, and lasting joy begins to spill over in our lives and people want to know where that comes from, we can tell them that it comes from you. Father God, for anyone watching online or in the room that, God, you've, you've just convicted them that they have never accepted the gift of your son, that they understand that they are the ones that Jesus was speaking about in that, in that moment, that I've come for those who know that they are sinners, that God, that they would just repeat these words, that their heart would speak to you in this moment and say, Jesus, that's me. I'm a sinner that needs a Savior. I accept you, the Son of God, as the Lord of my life. God, we know that by your Holy Spirit, you are going to do a transformational work in their hearts right now. God, thank you so much for the good news of great joy for all of us. In your name, Jesus. Amen.